is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings, and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's Testing. I'm going to call an audible reef. Let me do something before we show that video clip, if you don't mind. Uh, this morning, there were a very nice pair of uh, glasses left behind this morning in the first service, and uh, if nobody claims them, we'll do like Cinderella's, sli Cinderella's slipper and just line up and see whose eyes match the glasses, but, uh, but they're here. Uh, prayer requested for uh, a church member, Ed Mack, who is in uh, Seton on a ventilator, uh, severe COVID. Yes, he was inoculated. He gets to wake up and find out that his wife passed away yesterday. And so devastating to the family, uh, children involved, uh, grandmother who's trying to keep the whole thing woven together. They joined our church about a month ago. Uh, so it, we, we're, we're, in a, we're in a season of pandemic, and you can look the other direction, but no matter where you look, you're going to stumble into it. And, uh, but this one uh, is, is a ministry opportunity as well as a challenge on every front. I want to pray for them before we move forward. Father God, we thank you for our well-being, uh, the fact that we can be here. We drive past, past hospitals, and, and uh, Lord, we forget how much suffering is in those walls. Uh, so for Ed, Lord, we pray your healing. Uh, Father, for children, we pray for their life. Uh, Father, for this one who uh, grieves the loss of her daughter, uh, Lord God, we pray your mercy to her. Uh, Lord God, deliver us from this pandemic. Uh, we humble ourselves. We admit that uh, nothing we do works, uh, Father, and we ask uh, that you, O oh Lord, uh, be the remedy as you are in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Just real quick, I'll say in 30 seconds, uh, the pastor asked me to find uh, an icebreaker video. And so uh, every once in a while we find these ones uh, for Mother's Day or Father's Day. There's a little bit too many jokes in them for Sunday morning. Uh, some of you guys have known Jimmy for a, a long time. I go way back all the way to 530 with Jimmy. He seems like a guy that likes... <laughs> Seems like a guy that likes a joke, so I thought maybe on Sunday night we could be a little bit more jovial. It's parenting tonight, so we're going to uh, have mothers go first, and then uh, we'll have a Father's Day video and just kind of enjoy uh, that. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Becoming Your Mom support group. Uh, we have some visitors with us today. Welcome to you. My name is Mark, and I'm the group leader. And I think we'll start by reciting our mission statement. We love our moms but we are not our moms. We love our moms, but we are not our moms. Carol, would you mind starting us off this week? 
Hi everyone, I'm Carol. Hi Carol. I am the oldest of three roommates and I'm turning into my mom. I clean up everything after them. I've even started doing their laundry. I talk to myself in the grocery store all the time. All of my status updates are just pictures of kids. I don't even have kids. Same. Well, kids and recipes. The other day, I almost licked my finger and wiped the face of a total stranger. I keep saying words like garbage and tarje. What is that? I'll send a text to someone just to let them know I sent them an email. Well, how else would they know? Right? I mean, these shoes were on sale. What am I supposed to do? Not buy them? I call my husband my son's name. And sometimes I call my son the dog's name. I always tell people, I'll be like two minutes. Then it'll be like an hour. <laughs> whoa, whoa, take it easy there. Shannon already has a tissue. We really don't need to offer her one. I do. Did you see how they let the momness overtake them? So you may not be able to avoid becoming your mom, but the key is to let the beautiful things about moms shine through in your life. The kindness, the caring, the compassion, the qualities that God gave moms when he created them. Oh, like when I text my friends, LOL, lots of love. That's not what LOL means. That's what my son told me it meant. LOL, lots of love. What else, what else would it mean? You know, I used to be an amazing dancer. Now when I dance, people just get embarrassed. Can I show you? Yeah, yeah. no, Carol. Carol, sit down. Oh, it's not bad. Carol, please. One, two. Okay, dads, let's go ahead and get started, guys. Now, some of you have already let me know how uncomfortable you were in last week's meeting. So tonight, we're going to try to respect each other's boundaries. What? Tonight we've also got a guest with us, David. And would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, hey guys, I'm David. David. Hey, David. David. How many kids do you have, David? None, at least not at the moment. Uh, my wife is pregnant, and uh, she should be delivering any day now. Mm, that's great. So Super. Oh, great. Awesome. Who'd like to go first? Anyone. Anyone. I'll go. Perfect. Todd? Yes. My daughter and I went to the mall, and she said she wanted to take the stairs to the second level. And I said, I don't trust stairs, because they're always up to something. <laughs> Todd, I'm sorry that happened. Okay. I encourage you to try to resist the urge to make jokes like that. My turn? Okay. Can I go? Okay. Yesterday, actually, my daughter got home and she asked me how my day was. And I said, well, a guy tried to sell me a coffin, but that's the last thing I need. Oh, Jerry, oh, Jerry that Jerry. joke is dead on arrival. Because it's the last thing I need. David, how about you? Oh, I, I didn't, I didn't see. This is a safe zone. Just jump on in. Yeah, I, I'm, I guess I'm just scared of being a dad. I'm afraid I'm going to start telling bad jokes just like my dad. Well, it might be in our nature. We can fight against it. Hey, speaking of nature, I tried to catch some fog yesterday. I missed. <laughs> M-I-S-T. Oh, You're a monster. I... This is where the boundary is. I'm done. This is where you are. Hello? Really? Okay, yeah, no. Uh, yeah, I'll be right there. That was Julie. Her water just broke. I guess the baby finally ran out of womb. <laughs> I'm gonna be a dad. Don't you think it should be going? Oh, yeah. So I told my wife she drew her eyebrows too high. She seemed surprised. Well, welcome to 
first big night. Uh, next month, we'll have with us Dr. Michael Evans. He was last year's president of the Baptist General Convention of Texas. He is a dynamic, excited preacher. I'll say more about him later, but next, uh, the, the next month event will be, will be church. We'll do some music and some preaching, and, and it'll be revival style. Uh, tonight is uh, intellectual, instructional, heartwarming, and a reunion of sorts because Dr. Jimmy Myers worked here many years ago, and he raised some of our adults who have kids were in his youth group. Not to date you. You were 12 years old then. Correct. I understand that. Yep. But, uh, but Jimmy, when his name comes up in conversation, there is always a, a reverence and a cheerfulness to the reflection. That I, and I so appreciate that, that, uh, that, that he left a sweet taste in y'all's mouth at First Baptist Church. And uh, so I hope that those reunions will be, uh, will, will be renewed uh, tonight. But I want to tell you that he, when he left here, he's done really well. He is now Dr. Jimmy Myers. Mm -hmm. uh, he is founder of the Timothy Clinic in Austin, which is one of the most renowned uh, family uh, therapy clinics, uh, counseling centers. And uh, he's got a whole staff, uh, a whole lot of people, including his own son, still with you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, it's a neat operation down there. I hope you never need it, but I hope you get to go. Right. And now, uh, without taking more of his time tonight, I just want to say that he has uh, authored uh, several books, but he's brought two with him tonight, and they are on sale in the foyer, but nowadays people don't carry cash, and we're not set up to take your credit card tonight, and so we're taking IOUs for books, okay? <laughs> and so if you want the book, but you're not prepared to pay for it, just put your name on the line, and we'll get the account settled up later, but he makes sure that he gets paid for them. Uh, they're fifteen dollars each, or two for thirty. And uh, one is second edition, toe to toe with your team. The other is fearless parenting. And uh, we, uh, uh, I hope you never need them. But I hope mm -hmm. the reason you don't need them is because you thought of this ahead of time and you outsmarted your kids. <laughs> Amen. Because that's what we got. We got an edge. We've been thinking about this longer than they've been alive. Right? And so tonight, without more to do, uh, if I could lift up our brother in prayer, and then we'll give him the time. Uh, Jimmy has, has prepared uh, to talk about this and then some question and answer as well. So you might be about half of the program an hour uh, from what comes from you. And uh, did you always want, the, the last time I talked to a counselor, it was like $100 an hour, and here we sit, and it's free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. there we go. You want this hour. <laughs> Let's uh, pray. Father God, thank you, Lord, that Jimmy is talented with skills and abilities and expertise that he can share with us tonight. We thank you for where you brought him from, who you make him to be, and for his giftedness tonight before us. We ask, O oh Lord, that you illuminate minds, that you uh, unlock bad habits, that you give us thoughtfulness about what we do so that we won't just uh, instinctively falter and wind up frustrated. Thank you, Lord, for our kids. And we see them as a blessing on loan to us from you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay. Let's give a hand of uh, welcome tonight to Dr. Jimmy Martin. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. And could somebody turn on the uh, stained glass? I was sitting down here, and I just looked up, and I saw the stained glass. And that's from Clement's Chapel, uh, from the old facility. And it reminded me of, of uh, Desert Storm. And uh, all the soldiers and um, the casualties and uh, uh, stressful wives that were left with kids. Um, it's kind of weird, but that's actually a pleasant memory. I know it doesn't seem like it, uh, but it was. Um, which kind of brings me to First Baptist Colleen. I was um, um, I was a gunfighter at Six Flags Over Texas when Ken Andrus called and said, are you interested? And I said, in the youth and young adults position at First Baptist Colleen, didn't know at the time where Colleen was, and I said, well, I'll need to pray about it. Yes, I would be very interested. Um, and that was a long time ago, 30 And there's so many amazing memories, uh, but my most cherished memory is being able to look down and see my feet. Uh, I can remember when my stomach was an internal organ, uh, and, and it was really a lot. It was, it was in, the, in the clean days. Um, but it is just, it's crazy being back here and just, because it's, there's not a lot of people that share your life, you know? And you can look back and you just see people and you go, oh, well, they know. 
Uh, they were there. They get it. Uh, so it's a joy and it's a privilege to be back with you guys. So we are going to, are we there yet? Oh, heavens. I was looking at the one back there. The one back there just stays put. Okay. <laughs> That's good to know. Um, so I was asked in 20, well, before that, but it, it was published in 2017 uh, to do a book on, um, on parenting. And some of you guys know George Barna. He kind of was, <clears throat> he was instrumental in bringing empirical research to the church as far as, you know, it was great about church growth and, you know, trends within the church. But George really brought in uh, really academic research to back it up. And so it was really, he's written about 50 books, and it was really, really a great, it, like George was, Google before there was Google, because he's done all the research on everything there is to research. And the premise of the book ended up being, George said, well, here's what a young adult is going to look like in the year 2030. And not good. It was just not good. The, the trends, the numbers where this is sociologically heading really bad. And so the thought was then, um, that's the bad news, but the good news is that those same young adults in the year 2030 are still in your house. So you have an opportunity to do some things to, to alter this trajectory. And so that's what the whole kind of premise of the book is. We laid out 10 things that you could do to hopefully have that not happen. So it came, it was written in 2016 ish, came out in 2017, and this was before Antifa. It was before uh, people in authority and with great education telling our children that they can choose their gender. Um, so the, the, the timeline got moved up drastically from here's what a kid's going to look like in the year 2030. Uh, and it's, it's, it's almost scary how rapidly we got to that 2030 and just blew right on past it. Um, fearless parenting, when we, when we talk about that concept of how we parent, and yet fear is sort of the, the baseline main ingredient to how parents have parented, especially Christian parents, for like 100 plus years. And you cannot, I guess what? Fear is mentioned like over 300 times uh, in the Bible. You literally cannot swing a dead cat without hitting a verse on fear. And I didn't mean to trigger you if you're a cat lover. <laughs> that was my bad. So you can't swing a dead gerbil without hitting some verse <laughs> that has to do with not fearing. It's all over the place. Fear not. Uh, you know, do not be afraid. I mean, it's throughout all of Scripture that our faith is reflected by our lack of fear. Uh, and just uh, one of those 300 uh, in 2 Timothy, for God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. He didn't give us a spirit of fear, but I can guarantee you, as the vast majority of Christian parents over the past multiple decades, that was the single spirit in which they all shared, was being scared to death of culture and what culture was going to do to their child uh, and how it was going to just destroy everything. Uh, and so we said, well, we, we got to do something. We can't let this horrible secular culture just, just ruin our child. So we came up with this idea that, and again, this has been the prevailing approach to parenting for a century, protective fear-based parenting. Because we're afraid of culture, we're going to protect our kids from culture. And this begins with, and let's just take the culture in which I grew up in, in the 1970s. We're the ones who made it great, Mighty Senior 78. And if you've seen the movie Footloose, and I think they've actually made two of them now, haven't they? I think. Um, that, was, that was modeled on my life. I was the student council president that brought a dance in after 40 years in Cisco, Texas. Uh, and, <laughs> um, well, dancing was not good. 
uh, because only bad things happen where people are dancing. And so it was, you can, you can look at that one because we don't, a lot of us don't really share that anymore. So, but that would be an example of kind of when my parents were doing this. And so, first off, you clearly define, you identify and you define the sin. This is what's wrong and this is what isn't. I, was, I had a job once with a fellow seminary student and we were talking about dancing. And uh, I, you know, he said, it's, well, it's wrong. And I said, well, what if, just go with me, what if I am at the president's inaugural ball and my, uh, I'm in a tux and my wife is in a hoop skirt and I am waltzing with my wife, whom I can lust after if I darn well please. And if we're waltzing, is that a sin? He said, well, you're dancing, aren't you? I said, yeah, it's a sin. Okay, let's start at the beginning. So, clearly identify the sin. And then we demonize not only the sin, but the people, think back on your life. We demonize the sin and anyone who participates in the sin. And then we teach about the danger of being even in close proximity to that sin or that sinner. And then construct protective walls around our kids to make sure that they are not influenced by that sin. Um, this could very well be described with um, introducing you to Lulu. And if this was like a, a small group and this was, it was my daughter Lulu and, and her graduation party, then I would tell you that I'm so proud of Lulu because, I mean, she's, she's never seen an R-rated movie, much less the SEX. And she has never uh, touched the demon drink. And not only has she never uh, partaken of any weed type substance, she could not spell marijuana. And you probably wonder how we did it. How we, because you look at Lulu and you go, wow, gosh, she's perfect. She's the perfect Christian young lady. How did you do it? And I would tell you, well, there, we actually did. Beth and I had a plan. And what we did with Lulu was we locked her in the basement when she was 10. And we let her out this morning for the party. And her, her entire teen life, not a sin one. Our goal can't be for our child never to sin. It just can't. It can't. Um, because they are. And how do we know they are? Because you are. And I am. And everybody is. And yet, that seems to be sometimes... The goal of Christian parents. Christian parents, their heads explode if their kids just do like a normal wrong thing. Um, okay, we'll keep going. Um, so, this, we said this was over about a 100-year period that we've had this type of fear-based parent, fear parenting, and this would, of course, be known as a what? A flapper. 1920s. Good Lord, bar the door, lest my daughter get out and people see her ankles. <laughs> and then, of course, and this was actually taken from the first appearance of Elvis on the Ed Sullivan Show, and for Historian of the Week, what is significant about the camera angle here? Yes, no one could see his gyrating hips. We're talking, that is, pixelated lasciviousness. I, and of course, this, this kind of hit closer to me when I was a child, the Beatles. Uh, and growing up in West Texas, uh, before there was uh, Walmart, there was uh, Gibson's. And I was with my mother, and there at the end of the aisle, there's a huge box, and it said, Beetle Wigs. Well, back then, in the 60s, uh, most boys' haircuts, certainly mine, <laughs> um, was, we, we were just sheared you know, every you know, couple of weeks. And so we just had this, just nothing. And so when I saw the Beatles, it was like, if, I, if only I could have that hair. And well, here it was at Gibson's. And so I don't know how I did, but I talked my mom into buying one. And so I went home and I put on the Beatle wig and I had a tennis racket and I was going at, I want to hold your hand when my father walked in. And uh, that was not pretty. 
But that was in the 60s. And then, of course, when rap music hit, well, just Jesus come take us because that's the end, that's the end of all civilization. So it's been around forever. And it's been tried. Well, it was, Lord, it was tried, you know, this, this idea of just sequester Christians away from culture. That was the monastic period in world history where just, you know, monks you just closed up Christianity behind these very thick castle walls. And there was a reason it was called the Dark Ages. Because nowhere in Scripture do you find Christ or Paul or anyone else saying, go ye therefore and hide. We don't find it. You won't find it anywhere. So after I left Colleen, I was at uh, Hyde Park in Austin, and we had um, promotion Sunday, right? And so we had the sixth graders who were going up into the, the seventh grade, and it's busy, and there's, everyone's around, and um, <clears throat> this man comes with his daughter in tow, and I thought she was in trouble. <laughs> I realized I was. And so he said, I brought my daughter. <laughs> I swear he said Lulu, but that's probably not who he said. But he said, I brought my daughter. It's a Sunday school, and, and your people are playing rock and roll music. And, and, and then he softened because he looked at me like, you, you sad thing, because apparently you don't know. Um, the beat of the human heart is 4-4 four, four rhythm. Therefore, any song that's not in 4-4 four, four is of Satan. And I'm trying not to just die laughing. And he said, therefore... Uh, oh, and because it's a conduit for demonic influence and all those children that you have in the seventh grade. And I don't know what I said other than thanks. <laughs> that was information. He was, I, I didn't have that info. I, I did not know that. And so <laughs> I went down, and um, this is what was playing. He's got his father's eyes. El Shaddai. So, that guy was so out of his mind in being very hostile and judgmental. And I think sometimes when we, when we build these walls, it's very easy to become very judgmental uh, about seeing the sin that other people are doing. And I know from, you know, looking at um, you know, gosh, who are we going to base our faith on? Who are we going to base the faith of our church on? Well, how about, you know, let's aspire to be like Jesus. Well, no, that, that's shooting too high. How about Paul? Paul, would, no, that's still, oh, I know, those guys in the black. Let's, let's lay out our faith and lay out our church, and those are the guys we're going to emulate. It's the weirdest thing. Why would we choose the Pharisees? Literally the only group that he ever called a brood of vipers. And we're going, yep, that's what we want to be. The first church of the Pharisee. It's weird how loving and showing grace and turning the other cheek, those verses apparently just went right past us. And we locked in on thou shall not and left it there. I love this, because we say, well, we teach our kids, we, we teach them to love the sinner and hate the sin. Throw that out. We need to teach them to love the sinner and hate their own sin. Forget their sin. You have nothing to do with their sin. You love them, hate your own sin. Because we, and again, I don't know, but how can I judge you just because you're sinning in some way differently than I am. Because what are you saying, you're not? By the way, I did have a lady once said, I'm not. Oh, I know God's a good shot, but I'm just going to back up just a little. <laughs> she, and she believed it. She, I mean, she was being very honest. She, was a, she could not recall sinning. So we can't. I can't judge you, and I don't care what you're doing. The only person that can judge 
is God, because otherwise, you would have to claim perfection. Because that would be a little bit hypocritical if you're going to point out what they're doing wrong and ignore what you're doing wrong. And this is what we are, this is what rubs off on our children, is this idea that, it, well, if that sin is so bad, and if people who do it are so bad, they must not know how bad they are. That's why God put me in their life, to let them know just how bad they are. And of course, this is another, I mean, take the sequoia redwood out of your own eye, and then let's come talk about my speck. And for whatever reason, be it pride, prejudice, pride and prejudice, we can't seem to do that on a regular basis. And yet Paul implores us, if we speak with the tongues of men and angels, but don't have love, I'm a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. I'm just noise with nothing. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I don't have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. It is weird the amount of emphasis that Paul places on, on loving people. And not just loving people who love us back. Yep, pagans do that. We're called to love people who don't deserve. Because if we recall, God loved us when we didn't deserve. And again, no, obviously we're not teaching our kids that, but all they have to do is sit there with just a little bitty bag of popcorn and just watch. Watch and learn. This is how Christianity works. So, if preparation and fear-based parenting is not the way to go, then we institute preparation-based parenting, where we, our job now is to prepare our kids, not to sequester them away and protect them, but to prepare them to leave our homes and impact culture. You know, instead of worrying about what that junior high, you know, how that junior high is going to impact um, our kids, we ought to be worried about that junior high, how our kid is going to impact that school, what God is going to do through this young girl or this young man. So I'm going to real quickly... Some of you, and of course you don't, because this is forever, back in the 1950s, but there was a play, then a movie, Inherit the Wind. Spencer Tracy. God bless him. He, this was the Scopes trial of the 1920s, right? The, where the, the, the teacher was put on trial for teaching evolution when it was, it was illegal to teach evolution in Tennessee. And what you found from the, the play and the movie was the very first time that atheists were the loving, kind, open-minded, uh, tolerant ones. And the believers, the Christians, they were the hate mongers. They were uneducated. Uh, you know, they were very, very harsh and judgmental. And you see that paradigm uh, today. Because people believe, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you don't believe, you're really, really smart and great and kind and wonderful. And if you do believe, then you are uneducated, you're a rube, and you cling to your guns and religion. And that stays to this day. Dr. Gary Habermas, and if, if you guys have read A Case for Christ, he was one of the guys that was interviewed um, in that book. And I had him for one of the doctoral seminars, and his deal was the historicity of the resurrection. You know he's smart because he uses a word like historicity, which I had to look up. But he, he, for 30 plus years, he's traveled the world and he has debated at, at Harvard and Princeton, uh, he, uh, Oxford, Cambridge, and he has debated in the highest echelons of secular academia about whether the, re not that God exists, Oh, and he's Anthony Flew, which was at one time the world's most influential uh, philosophical atheist, Richard Dawkins. These are all people 
that Dr. Habermas, and, and when we say debate, we're talking an academic debate where there's either a panel who actually judges who scored, right? He made a point, he rebutted that, he got a point. Uh, or it's just the audience votes as to who won. But these are not just interesting like a presidential debate. You actually determine the winner. And so he's debated all these people all over the world. And so they, they said if you take Habermas, no matter what the course is, you're going to talk about the resurrection. And so that's what he did. And he was talking about what he did. And, and I just, I give him the Gospels and I just take Paul and Corinthians. And it just this and this and this and this and this. And so at a break... I went up to him and I said, uh, Dr. Habermas, you've been telling us all the things that you do, you know, the, the points that you make that really score, you know, but, but what happens in those debates where you lost? What points did they make? And he looked at me and said, I've never lost. Did y'all know that? That we have believers... Jesus-loving, Bible-believing Christians who debate the top minds in secular academics and we don't just hold our own, we win? Do your kids know that? So when they are confronted with this, oh, please, I don't want your Sunday school teacher tell you that. Um, when they're confronted with this, Smart people don't believe, dumb people do believe. That is factually, empirically incorrect. Can't go there. The vast majority of Nobel laureates uh, were Christians. Some of the greatest philosophers of all time um, were Christians. Um, uh, the, the former head of the, uh, he mapped the human genome. Uh, I forget his name. Bible-believing Christian. So this idea that if you're really, really smart, you know that this is all just like a, a scheme to milk people out of their money. But if you're a believer, you're a sucker for that sort of thing. And that's what, if not outright, that is what our kids are absorbing constantly from this culture. Uh, anytime a Christian is portrayed on television, he's a nut, he molests children, he's running a cult, you just don't get a believer that's just sort of a good guy and can figure out who murdered who. You don't get that anywhere uh, on television. Um, and here's what we found, that families in the church, we have done a fantastic job in teaching our kids what to believe, but a horrendous job in teaching our kids why we believe it. I don't think there's one child in any church that would dispute the fact that Zacchaeus was a wee little man. But which creation story do we believe? The one where uh, man was created first and helped God name the animals, or where he was created last, the crowning achievement of God's creation? Which one? Did Judas, did he hang himself, or was he, did he jump off a cliff? Which one? And, well, before I get there, we want our kids asking that. Even if it makes us pucker, we, they have to be asking these. We want, please, ask these things. I was so blessed in Cisco to have Reverend Buddy Sipe, and every Sunday night, he would go to his office and he'd take two cans of Pepsi and he would wait for me to get there. And I had this long list of questions. What about this? And what about that? And what about this? And, and he would answer those for me. And if he didn't know the answer, he would say, okay, that's a good, come back next week. And he would show me the answer and also where he got the answer to some question. It was, it was beautiful because he encouraged me to ask. And we should encourage our kids to ask as many questions, questions as they can. And probably one of the great ones for, you know, just a, a, across the board that really has plagued Christianity forever is this. If God is all-loving and all-powerful, then how can 
evil and suffering exist in the world. Your kids are going to get that if they haven't already and show up around the dinner table. Uh, Dad, question for you. <laughs> because if, if, if God is all-powerful and he could stop evil and suffering, but he chooses not to, well, then he's not all-loving. And if he's, if he's all loving and he could stop it if he could, but he can't, then he's not all powerful. So which is it? And I know none of you in this room, most of you in this room, some of you in this room don't need this. I get that. You're sitting there going, what? Well, you know? The Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. And that would be really cool if we were in Mayberry in 1962. Because, by the way, this has nothing, this is not for you. This is, you don't, of course, you don't need it. But we live in a time, your children, your grandchildren live in a time where we just can't say, the Bible says, and I believe it, and that settles it. They look at you like you have two heads. And again, I grew up where the schools didn't even give homework on Wednesdays so the kids could go to church. Now we have entire leagues of lacrosse and soccer that only take place on Sunday mornings. Different. When your kids say they're the only believer they know of in school, they are now no longer exaggerating. Um, they might exaggerate about everything else, but not that. And most likely it's true. Because statistically, we live in a country now that is non-Christian. There's more people claiming something else or nothing than claim Christianity. So this idea that we live in a Christian nation and everyone aspires to want to believe this and they realize they're not doing well and they really should give their life back, that does not exist. That's gone. And we have got to adapt. We've got to recognize the reality of the culture in which we live. Because um, when we have kids come out of our churches, out of our homes, and we have not addressed the why, it's like a lamb to slaughter. We're asking them to do something they're not prepared to do because they're going to get eviscerated. Now then, and it's, it's true, and I probably even should not have even used graduation, but that's kind of when we leave home. The thought has always been, well, this kid was great and solid as a rock until he went to college and some professor taught him about evolution. No, we now have research that shows that most kids stop believing probably in about the eighth grade. And they are coming for social reasons. They're coming because of an expectation placed them. They're coming because they kind of wish they could, but it doesn't fit. Lee Strobel said, Christians are going to have a tough time in the 21st century sharing their faith if they don't understand firmly why they believe what they believe and have the ability to defend it. Now, this is asking parents, grandparents, all you guys, to do what we've never really had to do before. I mean, whoever said, you know, part of the deal was studying apologetics, which is a defense of the faith and why you believe something. But we just live in a time where that is just absolutely... Now, loving people, letting people see Christ in you, that's all, absolutely, that is still makes us the salt, makes the, 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 the world thirsty for God. But having a knowledge of why we believe what we say we believe is, is, is critically important in this time. And again, you don't have to know all the answers, you just have to know where they are. Um... And the two that start off with, just right off the bat, is Strobel's A Case for Christ. Um, can the Bible be trusted? 2,000 years old, written by a bunch of guys in skirts, and you're telling me that I should live my life according to this? Um, it's, a, it's phenomenal. Uh, and it's written in such a way that's very compelling. He used to be a, a reporter uh, for the Chicago Sun-Times, I think. And there's a movie about it now his life and and how he um 
he was really trying to discredit Christianity. But the more he interviewed and the more he talked to people, uh, he became a believer. So just kind of how the Bible can be trusted that we actually can say with some certainty that this man, Jesus, did exist, these things did happen, because they're recorded in places other than the Bible. Did you know that? That they're recorded in other places? Jewish historian Josephus, Tacitus, the Roman uh, historian, mentions Jesus and his followers who claimed that he was God and claimed that he came back to life. And this is not the Bible. Um, so really do, I mean, you start there, but bottom line, and that's what you pay this guy for. Come ask him. What about this? What about that? Um, we can no longer, I guess, dismiss it. Uh, and, and talking about the, the, the ten things that we can change, I just want to touch on one very quickly, and that is taking spiritual responsibility for our kids. You taking spiritual responsibility for your children, not Randy, not any other minister. I used to have in my office a little cartoon. Uh, it was a police line. A kid was being, you know, his head being put in the back of a police car, and on the other uh, side of the police tape, um, his mother was screaming, where did his youth minister go wrong? There comes a time where we have to, and, and it used to break my heart when people would call and say, oh, my child is ready to pray to receive Christ, and we want to bring him in so that you can... Really? Really? That person has sat in more sermons, been in more small groups, had more Bible studies, been in more conferences, read more books. If that person, if you squeezed her, she'd burp a proverb, and yet here she is calling me to have this once-in-a-lifetime, unimaginable opportunity to kneel with your child and pray with them to have Jesus come into their heart. We have to say, and, 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 and it's almost gotten to where parents, some parents today, it's, hey, I, I took him on Wednesday, I took him to church, I took him to Sunday school, I took him on Wednesday nights. I even made him go to retreats. I mean, it's like being their spiritual Uber driver is all that you're responsible for. Getting them to the place. And then let the professionals handle it from there. That is something... You know, if we keep doing the same thing the same way, expecting really different results, what are we? We're crazy. And at some point, we've got to start doing different things as parents and as churches in a different way uh, in order to affect a different result. And then the other things, real quickly, uh, the other things within the book that we talk about um, is teaching our kids that they were created to stand out. Uh, they should stand out. That's a, that's a good thing. Uh, and not to shrink back, prioritize family, reject destructive parental behaviors like anger and guilt and shame, uh, reject material entitlement, rethinking um, you know, cell phones and social media, uh, addressing pornography, and the last one is the push uh, about uh, kids uh, in sports and how it's, it's much more, in, in, in many cases, it's much more the parents pushing than it actually is the kid leading in what they want to do. Um, so anyway, those were the ten, and let's take some time to visit. Any other thoughts or questions, anything come up? I'm, I'm going to jump to a question that, that a friend posed to me. He's a, a single dad raising a daughter, right? The, the mom took off after birth, and he, uh, he's like, how old is the right age for his daughter to get a cell phone? She's eight, but she's on the school bus, and he worries about her. And, and I, I want to just, just kind of speak to this whole yep. social media phone. These are things. Here's the thing. If we buy it and hand it to them, and it's toxic, we kind of ought to know that. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I mean, that's kind of, if, if, we're, if we're paying a price for it every month, we don't want to pay to poison our kids. Talk to us about yes. that. Um, Everything you want your child to have a phone for is accomplished in the dumb part of the phone. Everything they get in trouble with is in the smart part of the phone. 
So the issue here is not a smartphone problem. Here comes a dad joke. It's a dumb parent problem because we keep handing it to them, and then we're shocked with what they do with it. This is the whole thing of, of being okay for your kid to stand out. It's okay for them not to have a phone. You didn't have a phone, and you're here. So we basically said that we agreed upon... Um, <laughs> sorry, kids. 16. There, and, and, and at the Timothy Center, we have started three years or so ago, and we now have the largest sexual addiction with kind of a, um, an emphasis on, on Christians and uh, pastors and staff members, church leaders in sexual addiction. And um, hearing those stories all day, every day, you would take your child's cell phone and throw it into the deepest sea. A cell phone is is by a magnitude of a thousand more dangerous than anything else in their life. Um, therefore, I'm thinking, if you can trust a... How much does a car weigh? If you can trust a 2,000-pound death machine to a teenager at 16, we'll, we'll, we'll start talking about uh, a smartphone. Uh, and the great thing about, it, uh, about a smartphone now is you can almost dumb them down to where it's just a dumb phone. There are, there's Bark, um, a, a great company uh, that is based out of Israel, but their, their American startup is in Austin, and we kind of work with them, called Canopy, um, that is pretty remarkable for, for what it does. But bottom line, uh, you know, kids just, it's just too dangerous. It's just too dangerous. And if our only uh, reason, uh, you know, to really push for them to have it is so, well, everyone else has it, that's the worst reason ever for our kids to have it. And so, again, this, smartphones are just, just uh, insanely dangerous for our kids in ways that we don't even know. And our kids know how to use them way better than most adults do. So when your 12-year-old says, uh, yeah, um, my history teacher said there's this app, it's called Tinder, and so we're supposed to have it for history. And so if you could just let me download Tinder. And most parents, well, okay, here you go. Let's see that grade. I hope it's better this semester. We don't know. You know, we'll just believe anything they say and download anything we're supposed to, and let me get back to my movie. So this is one of those issues where the kid knows a lot more than the parent does. Uh, and and it's not just it's not just pornography. It's uh, our kids don't know how to make eye contact. They don't know how to make small talk. Uh, when when people are waiting for a meeting to be over to go in or whatever, no one's asking. So you know, how's your son? Or uh, how did you do on that report? Every person waiting to go in is looking at their phone. We're we're raising a generation of socially inept children uh, and again that, that's that's apart from all the other destructive things that they can get their hands on so our deal is 16 which is is extraordinarily unpopular in the younger crowd but again but the thought is well the technology is there and it would be cool they're on the bus get them a flip phone it does everything you want or need without the fear there was a an op-ed a couple of years ago in the Dallas Morning News and it said that um, when uh, oh goodness uh, when, when sixth grade okay that's it when sixth graders can access rape porn on their cell phones then school itself becomes a toxic environment and this is from a, a mom whose 12-year-old daughter was shown that material. And these boys said, well, this is what we're going to do to you. And see how much she loves it? You're going to love this. And she didn't do anything. She didn't go looking for anything. So even if you lock down your kids and make sure that you... 
they're going to be on a bus. They're going to be at a, in a lunch. They're good. We're, and now we're back to preparation-based parenting, preparing them for when things like that occur. So, yeah. Well, actually, today they're marketing dumb phones for kids where they look like a smartphone. They even have games that don't access an internet, but have games on them. But they're dumb phones because there's a market for them. Anybody, anybody? Come on. Let me, let me jump in because I invited you here and you're, <laughs> you're, you're starting to ask about Outside of take your kids to church, because we, we, we don't want to un, or, you know, we, we love having good youth ministry, children's program, da da da. What sort of things would happen in a home where parents were, were taking the time to share? Right? You, you understand? So yes. let's assume that, that they turned off the TV and something else happened. Yep. What should happen in that? I, we had a guest at our house. They were profoundly amazed that we only had one TV in our house. Because they knew we were rich, right? It wasn't a matter of money. Why would we possibly only have one TV in our house? And this kid was just amazed because at their house, they have one per room so that if anybody wants to watch them, then they all go to their separate corners, so to speak. Talk to us about family and faith and fun. Well, the one thing, and, and again, a lot of kids grow up thinking that God, God is in this building because the only time God's ever mentioned, talked about, brought up, it's here or is going to here or is leaving here and most of the conversations when we leave church is good lord randy can't preach his way of a wet paper bag <laughs> i don't know who that lady was that brought the special but she couldn't carry a tune in a bucket that's what our kids hear they have roast preacher for sunday meal but they don't say hey guys that sermon was about this have you ever thought has that ever happened what about this whatever's going on in the kids sunday school making sure parents have access to what they're learning so they can talk about it when they get home they can carry it back with them um, so that god isn't here and then we're over here but god's in all this um, so often the only prayer that a kid gets in his home is bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies and now I lay me down to sleep. And Zippo in between. And again, kids are smart enough to go, this is, I'm noticing this. Uh, if God is this amazing thing, uh, how come I don't see him anywhere outside of church? So just the simple thing. Of, of just talking about what the sermon was about, talking about what was in Sunday school. That's it. No big, huge curriculum. Uh, not some big family hearth night. Uh, just talking about what happened on Sunday. Um, that's the easiest thing. Uh, and then you could kind of go from there. Because having once a week or something like that, some type of family devotional would be fantastic. A lot of people are intimidated by that. Um, and I know a lot of churches help people do that. Um, you know, hey, here's how you can do it and make it as easy as possible. Uh, but just small stuff. Uh, again, we've got this idea that, God, you know, we hire professionals to do this. I'm not a professional. Uh, and the more I, you know, look at the New Testament, there is there's just not a lot of difference between the clergy and the laity. You know, I figured out, I don't know, 15 years into my church staff work and figured I was just, I'm like a professional Christian. I'm a pro. I get paid for this. Other people give their vacations hours and hours and hours and hours and hours a week, and they get bupkis. I show up, and everyone says I'm a great thing. I'm getting paid to be there. 
volunteers are giving their life because they love these kids and they want Jesus in their lives. So one of the major downfalls of where we are in, a, in, a, in the church today is we've got this spectator mentality. That just people in the pews just sit back and they watch the pros. And they figure, nary the twain shall meet. And that, and boy, Satan loves that. Because that may be the single most ineffective way of impacting a generation with the gospel. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. And there's, there's really, there's a good side to both of those things to really hone in on the needs of what's exactly happening in a teenager's life and in a way that they're going to really understand it. Um, and then there's something to be said for multi-generational worship uh, and letting those young ones see those of us with lighter hair, uh, you know, worship and, 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 and singing some hymns. You know one of the phenomena today is we've got all these non-denominational churches, non-denominational churches and worship teams and... Um, you know, if you don't have a smoke machine, you are behind the times. And yet, the biggest church growth within kind of the, the traditional church is in traditional worship. Kids who are raised in it get out and they want that. They, they, and my kids, you know, they, no, Josh doesn't. Two of the three go to um, more contemporary churches, but they all... Um, they all, they all have this soft spot when, when, you know, they hear this is my story and this is my song. Uh, they don't roll their eyes. It's still there inside of them. And that seed was planted, of course, when they were young. So there's, there's something to be said for both of those. And it's probably not an either or, it's a both and. All right. I appreciate it, guys. And if I could, oh, yeah. Um, like moves him culturally or in with his peers no and, and in fact it's yes there certainly is um, because you know, the problem, we're instructed to speak the truth, right? But to speak the truth in love. Um, the problem is, and you saw this, a big thing with when I was doing church work, there's a thing called relationship evangelism. And they said, well, that's the closest thing to the New Testament. You know, it's not knocking on doors and giving somebody a tract. That, you can't find that, the gospel spreading that way. It was with knowing somebody. And so we get to know them. And then we share uh, Christ with them. But what the downfall of relationship evangelism is that we cared so much about relationship that we never got to the gospel because I wouldn't want to offend. And we live in a world now that 
people are looking to be offended. They want to be offended. In fact, they demand that you offend them. And so it's even more so now. I mean, so to be able to say, this is what I believe, love you to death, and of course, you can believe whatever you want, but this is, this is what I believe and why, and let the chips fall. And I think you said it, you know, if, if we do this and, and society kicks us out, then so be it. That's not us retreating from society. But if people say, because you believe in Jesus, we're not going to associate with you, then that is, the New Testament anyway, count it pure joy when you experience these various kind of trials. That is a, that's sort of a badge of honor. Uh, John Wesley, is he the, the outlaw that shot people? Or the founder of the Methodist Church? But anyway, Wesley, he was a, a circuit-riding preacher, and uh, there was a quite famous story about him when he went into a town, and um, he was all depressed, and, and people said, you know, hey, um, you know, what's wrong? They didn't want to offend him just in case he was the guy who shot people, but they said, what's, what's wrong? And he says, well, it's been three days, and no one's thrown anything at me. And there's part of us that need to be okay with conflict about our faith. Again, we speak the truth and we speak it in love and we're not arrogant, we're not judgmental and those you know, self-righteous, ugh. but we can also humbly and with love take a stand. And right now, we don't take a stand. Uh, we conform in order to maintain relationships. And once again, there's nowhere in the New Testament that we're ever asked to conform in order to maintain relationships. So I think one is us intentionally, voluntarily segregating ourselves. There's another is society does that to us. And we've got to be okay with that. And we've got to be okay with our kids being excluded, not being asked to go to certain things. We've got to be, we have to be okay with that. Because the alternative is we're going to let your peers pressure us as parents. And, and that's no way no, which is Spanish for not good. All right. That's it? All right. Did you say no way no? <laughs> <laughs> no. Can I pray for everybody real quick? I would love for you to do that. All right. Father, I thank you for tonight, and I thank you for every person that's here. Because I don't know why they're here, um, but they're in this room because you divinely appointed for them to be in this room at this time. And when we talk about all the current stuff that's going on, um, it just seems like there is one crisis after another. Uh, it seems as though we, we look out into this country of ours and it's unrecognizable. And that anxiety certainly bleeds down onto our kids and we're, we are, we are scared. We are afraid of what this culture is going to do to our children. But we do want to claim the promise that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And Father, we have to know that every parent, every grandparent in this room, not by chance, but by divine providence, God has raised each of you up for such a time as this. God saw in his infinite wisdom for you to parent children at this time in American history and in world history. Uh, it, it didn't sneak up on God. This was not an accident. He saw you, and he saw in you what he wanted for someone that is going to mold and shape and grow the next generation of believers. So, Father, I pray, you said in James, that if we lacked wisdom, that if, uh, if we ask, you would grant it. So, Father, I pray that these parents and grandparents and teachers, I pray that you would give them a supernatural portion of your wisdom, and above all else, in this current state, Father, please give them the gift of your peace, a peace that you promised would surpass all human understanding. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Give Dr. Myers a hand of appreciation. If, if, if I could uh, uh, just, just follow through from all of my observations, that is, 
you, uh, your kids will pick up what you're excited about. If you want them to have a faith in Christ, work on your faith with Christ. Uh, when one guy had four sons. Three of them went into ministry. They asked, what did your dad do? Like, like, like did they, you know, uh, spiritual boot camp. What did your dad do? His, his answer was a black leather chair and a red letter Bible. The, the, the dad just, just had his quiet time every day. And, and the kids saw that that was what made dad tick. If, if it don't work for you, you can't give it away. But if it works in you, it is contagious. It's more contagious than you ever realized it is. Uh, we'll talk some more about that. Uh, my, my biggest anxiety being a pastor is that the Christianity that we grew in our church would be toxic to my children. Right? That somehow being a pastor's kid would, would disadvantage them. And my aspiration was when they grow up and when they're adults that they actually would want to go to a church and associate with Christian people. And I'm so proud that my kids associate with Christian people that, that they, they go to church. So Tyler's like, uh, 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 he was at third grade, we're heading to children's choir. He's, he's in the back seat of the car because that's the safe place. We're driving downtown. He says, Dad, when, when I grow up, I'm not going to church. I was like, oh, man, what did I do wrong? I, I said, really, Tyler, that makes me sad. I said, can I ask why? He said, because church is boring. I said, Tyler, they make churches that aren't boring. He said, Dad, can we go to that church? <laughs> I was the pastor. <laughs> like, yeah, we can't switch churches when you're the pastor. Hey, we need to have church conference real quick, and that's what this paper at the back was for. If you're not a part of our church uh, and, and you want to be back there buying a book in the lobby or something, you're, of course, excused to slip that way. Uh, but church conference is, is so uh, 